Welcome to the Faith Assembly live stream. Our goal here at Faith is to help you connect, grow, and go. We want to help you connect to active faith, grow in that faith by providing opportunities to do so, and then to go and live out the Great Commission. Our prayer is that as you join us in this time of worship and studying the Word, that you will be encouraged and you too would connect, grow, and go. Thanks for joining us and we hope you enjoy the service. Today is the day we put aside to remember fallen heroes and to pray that no heroes will ever have to die for us again. They chose to reject the fashionable skepticism of their time. They chose to believe and answer the call of duty. They stood for something. And we owe them something. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it. We will not surrender for it now or ever. We must realize that no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. It is a weapon our adversaries in today's world do not have. It is a weapon that we as Americans do have. With God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. At the grave of a hero, we end not with sorrow at the inevitable loss, but with the contagion of his courage and with a kind of desperate joy we go back to the fight. As we celebrate Memorial Day and celebrate those people who gave a sacrifice for us, I'm reminded of someone who gave a sacrifice for our freedom in Him, amen? Through Christ and through His sacrifice, nothing is impossible. Let's put our hands together and worship our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, this morning.
right up mountains and you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you
Father, we thank you so much for your love. God, that you would send your one and only Son. That you would be separated from your one and only Son so he could come. Live a blameless life and die for our sin. God, we could never repay you for that. But we thank you and we honor you. Holy, overwhelming, never ending, reckless love, God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves my life. I could. Still you give yourself away. 
place of worship. The writer Matt Redmond in this church. We're going through a season together where they said, you know what? Worship has become about something else. It's become about the music. It's become about the song. It's become about what we do in the context of a Sunday morning. And they said, we need to get back to the heart of worship. And so they took a season in their church where they said, we're going to let the band go down. We're not going to have music. We're going to come together with our Bibles and with our voices. And we're going to get back to the heart of worship. We're not going to rely on the music. We're not going to rely on the tools that we have to dictate what kind of worship that we give God. And, you know, as I read this story, they said the first couple of weeks there were some awkward silence because everybody's so used to music. But then something began to happen in the hearts and in the lives of the people in their church. They began to stop focusing on the music. They began to stop focusing on what they had become so accustomed to and what worship was in the mindset of music. And they began to focus on God. And they began to focus on their heart and what they had to offer to God. And something shifted in their church. And they came together as one and began to worship without music. And something happened that changed their church, that changed the people that were a part of that. They said, we want to become producers of worship, not consumers of worship. And I believe that God is calling us to the same. I believe that God's saying, I want your heart more than any of this. I want your heart every day of the week. I want every decision that you make, every thought that you have, every place you go, every person you encounter to be actions and words and thoughts of worship. And I believe that as we begin to do that, we're going to see a shift in our church as well. But not just in our church, we're going to see a shift in our hearts and in our lives and in our community. So I want to encourage you this morning to let's open our hearts to God. To let's say, God, you know what? No matter whether I have music, no matter whether I have what I'm accustomed to, if I'm in my car, if I have a CD or a playlist or not, when I'm at work, even though I'm not in the context of a service, that I'm going to worship you with my decisions. I'm going to worship you with my heart and truly get back to the heart of worship and get back to what it's all about. Father, bring us back to that place. Bring us back to a place where our hearts are focused on nothing but you. Let us worship you in spirit and truth. Just to be something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you. much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship 
people of the Lord. Lift your voice this morning and praise him. Hallelujah. Would you just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity, Lord, to gather in this place. Lord, to worship you, God, to feel your presence, God. Lord, together with those of like faith, God, to be encouraged today, we give you the glory, the praise and the honor, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, let our praise today, oh God, be a sweet aroma before you. Hallelujah. Lord, let it be a pleasing sound in your ear today, God. Lord, as our brother said, Lord, we don't want to be consumers of worship today only, Lord, but we want to be producers, God. Lord, we want out of our heart to flow praise and adoration, oh God, for you, because you have blessed us beyond measure, oh Lord. You have given us life, oh Lord. You have given us everything that we need, Lord, and we bless you today. We give you glory. We give you praise. Come on, church. Lift the name of Jesus in this place. Lift the name of Jesus in this place. Lift the name of Jesus in this place today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What an awesome time to be in the house of the Lord together this morning. What an awesome opportunity to worship with you and just experience the presence of the Lord together in this house. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if you missed the opener this morning, uh, we did celebrate those that have fallen and died and given the supreme sacrifice for this nation. And if we have, we have so much more, but if we had nothing else this morning to think of for which to be thankful, it would be the opportunity to gather in this manner. No harassment, your own free will brought you here today. Nobody's trying to keep you out. Nobody's trying to hinder you while you're here. Nobody's trying to control your worship. But freely today you can come and partake together of the presence of the Lord. Isn't that awesome? So we're thankful today. We're thankful today for those who are willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice. And we're thankful today for Jesus as we think about Memorial Day. We can't mention sacrifice without Calvary. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Would you
Would you give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? I'm going to invite our ushers to come and wait on you this morning for our morning tithes and offerings. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to just continue with this spirit and attitude of worship today as we give. And certainly I know that across this room today we can reflect on so many blessings that have come to us from the Lord today. And I just ask you this morning in the spirit of gratitude and appreciation and a measure of faith today that you would let that arise in you and that you would honor the Lord today, not to enrich Him, but to obey Him and position yourself to receive blessing from Him. Father, we come to you in the strong name of Jesus, giving you the glory, the praise, the honor for everything that you've done for us, God. We thank you, Lord, for so richly blessing us. We thank you, Lord, that there's a roof over our head, there's shoes on our feet, there's food in our stomachs, oh God. Lord, that we are a satisfied people, Lord, with the good things that you have provided, Lord. And we bless you and give you the glory. And Lord, we come to return a portion of that that you've asked and required of us today, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to bless both gift and giver today for the glory and the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you as you give. Welcome to Faith Assembly. Thanks for joining us. If you're a first time guest, we want to ask you to grab a connection card from the seat in front of you. If you will fill that out front and back and take it to our guest connections table, we have a gift for you. Welcome home. Reaching Our City's Kids is an outreach program bringing the gospel to kids in our area. The ROP team will be meeting at the Kittrell Town Apartments this summer. 
We are in need of volunteers who are passionate about reaching the kids in our community with the gospel. If you're interested in this, there will be an informational meeting on Sunday, June 3rd with Joe Bicknell and Gretchen Williams in room 108 immediately following service. Pizza will be provided. Ladies and teen girls, I am so excited to invite you to our upcoming Power Up Party. It will be on June 8th. Doors will open at 6 p.m. for snacks, boutique shopping, door prize registrations, and so much more. You don't want to miss arriving on time for the door prize registrations. We'll be giving away two registrations for our Gather Conference that will take place on September 21st and 22nd, as well as some items from our Faith Woman Boutique. Our special guest for our Power Up Party is Cheryl Denton. And I will also be sharing a word as, mi as well as many other things planned for this wonderful Power Up Party. The event is free, but we would like for you to register at faith-assembly.org under the events tab. Child care is also available as well. We are so excited about our Power Up Party. Come ready to power up together. Shipwrecked VBS is coming up on July 23rd through the 27th, and we need your help. If you're interested in helping out with VBS, visit faith-assembly.org slash events. Click on the VBS volunteer link and you can find a complete list of ministry opportunities. If you're interested in serving at VBS this year, there will be a volunteer meeting on May 31st at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Hey Voltage, you do not want to miss the Ohana experience this year for camp. It will be held July 17th through 20th at a new facility, the Ridgecrest Conference Center. Our speaker for the week will be Chris Estrada. You can get signed up at faith-assembly.org. Hope to see you there. Donuts with Dad is on June 17th at 9.30 a.m. in the foyer right here at Faith Assembly. Come join us for an awesome time of fellowship as we celebrate our dads. Graduation Sunday is coming up on June 3rd. If you're graduating from high school or college, we would love to recognize you in service. Please visit faith-assembly.org slash events and fill out the Graduation Sunday link to be recognized. You will not want to miss Paint Wars 18. It's going to be held June 10th, right after church until 4 o'clock. Lunch will be provided. It's for all rising 6th graders and current Voltage students. It's going to be a day full of water and paint. You'll leave looking like rainbow bright. For more details, go to www.faith-assembly.org. Coming up July 9th through the 13th at Crowder's Ridge in Gastonia, North Carolina. If your child is interested in attending, please visit faith-assembly.org slash events for more information. If you're new here at Faith Assembly, we want to invite you to Pizza with the Pastors on Sunday, June 3rd, immediately following service. This is an awesome opportunity to learn more about life here at Faith and to connect with our leadership. We want to let you know about some exciting ministry opportunities we have in the production department here at Faith. We have opportunities in sound and media, lighting, as well as live stream, which just in the past three weeks, we've had over 1,500 views on our stream. We also want to include photography for our social media page. Now, even if you don't have experience in any of these areas, you can still be a part. We have a place for you if you can just click a button. If you're interested, we want you to text media team to 97,000. I hope that you uh, got all of those things there. I do want to make mention of one error there is in the bulletin. If you got that this morning, the widow's ministry, uh, the date for that meeting is actually uh, the first Tuesday of each month. That is not May 1st. I know that the year is zooming by, but May 1st has already been. So that will be June the 5th. Uh, that we'll be looking forward to that widow's ministry meeting here at the church in room 106. Also want to make mention to you really quickly that we do need volunteers for our shipwreck VBS and you can find a link on our website if you want to go and volunteer and see all the jobs that are available there. All of the, nah, see I did it. You know, I just, I did it. Did you hear what I said? I said see all the jobs that are available there. It's not a job. 
It's a ministry. So you can go and see all the ways that you can be involved in ministry there at faith-assembly.org under the events tab. And you can find that there. There is an informational meeting uh, Thursday evening here in the fellowship hall at 7 p.m. And we just would love to have all of you come out and volunteer to make a great Bible school this summer. All right, you ready to get into the word this morning? Amen. Well, if you will remember with me, if we could take a brief trip down memory lane this morning, think all the way back to January. Uh, in January, we kicked off this year and we announced to you and cast a vision for you for a theme for this year. How many of you remember what that theme was? My point exactly. All right. Okay, so anyway, how many of you remember us talking about the issue of togetherness in the body of Christ? We had the thing out front, together. Yeah, there you go, all right. Praise God. We spent four weeks gathered around the subject of togetherness within the body of Christ, and we even, we've even launched ministries aimed at building togetherness in this body, in this fellowship of believers. Uh, back in the winter, we, could, we launched our connect groups. We have been so pleased with the progress of our connect groups. We've heard so many great testimonies and reports. I had an opportunity just a couple of weeks ago to meet with a bunch of our leaders here and they were telling me all, all kinds of great things that were happening in the, in the context of those meetings and the relationships that were being built and the connections that were being made uh, in the body of Christ. So uh, a lot of those are wrapping up. They finished that first quarter and they're going to be taking some time off during the summer or maybe a little lighter schedule during the summer at least. Uh, some are going to be in full, full blown steam going through the summer, but I challenge you towards the fall. Maybe you've got a hectic summer schedule, maybe you've got a lot of things uh, that you're looking at on the calendar, but come the fall time when things seem to kind of settle down more, I challenge you to get involved in a connect group and uh, just really get plugged in to some fellow believers and, and, and just be encouraged in that. I think it's a powerful, wonderful ministry that we have available here for you. But anyway, I, I feel like, as illustrated here this morning, that it's time to refocus. It's time to, to turn our attention back to the direction that the Lord gave us for this year. And uh, there are a handful of thoughts about which I would like our minds to be ever focused uh, and, and just to be continually at the forefront of our thoughts. One of those is Jesus. I think that as believers, we ought to always be focused on Jesus. I'm going home, all right? It's just it's too tough, all right? One of, one of those things is Jesus. We, we as believers need to be excited. We need to be thinking about Jesus, right? Right? Uh, no moment needs to pass during the day. That, that we're not thinking about him, that we're not aware of his presence, that we're not continually rejoicing in our salvation and worshiping him. We need to be thinking about Jesus. I think the second thing that we ought to always be thinking about as believers, as we talked about last week here in our message, we ought to continually be thinking about lost souls. We ought to be, be continually aware and ever vigilant in our pursuit as Jesus has commissioned us to make disciples of all men. And then there's a third thing that I would like for us to really be focused on as believers and just continually keep at the forefront of our thoughts. And that's not just the lost souls that are outside, but it's the fellow believers that are inside the body of Christ. Fellow Believers, Look across the aisle just a minute. Just look around you for just a second here this morning. Yeah. I want you to be thinking about those people that you just saw. I want you to be praying for them. I want you to be lifting them up to the Lord. I want you to be encouraging them. I want you to be supporting them. And, uh, you know, not only are we in Christ, but members of his body also with one another. So we need to continually be thinking about our fellow believers. Now, it's hard to believe that this year is half over almost. It is almost 
half over. So I felt like it was time for, just felt prompted that it was time for a refocus of our thoughts. It's time to reminisce about the vision that the Lord has set before us. And today I want to return to the idea of togetherness. Okay, some of you need to scribble that on a paper and put it on your refrigerator under the magnet there so you can remember it after this Sunday on that that's what we're talking about right now. I want to talk about the idea of togetherness. Now see, when we set out at the first of the year with a theme and we introduced to you this idea of togetherness, that wasn't so that, I mean, we didn't go to a seminar and somebody tell us that, hey, your church needs a theme for the year. And you need to have a, a sick slide that goes along with it and some promotional materials out in the foyer. No, 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 no. What we did is we prayed and we sought the Lord and said, Hey, Lord, where do you want us to lead this church this year? What is the direction that we need to take these people? And one single word that kept rolling over and over and over in our spirit over time and again was the word together. That word of being together in the body of Christ. And this is, this is not just a theme for the sake of having one. It's a direction of focus from the Lord. I, I've, I've heard from the Lord. We've heard from the Lord as leaders of the church here. And that is something that I'm reluctant to say in many cases. But, but I'm sure of it this time. And... Of the things that Joshua heard in the Old Testament, the things that he heard from the Lord, that he was sure he'd heard from the Lord on, he was also instructed of the Lord that he would rehearse those things in the hearing of the Hebrews. You remember that? He said, tell them that over and over. Rehearse that thing for them. So I'm here, and for the next few weeks, we're going to be rehearsing again this idea, the thing that we've heard from the Lord this year. We're going to be rehearsing that thing in your hearing, and we're going to be focused on some places where you and I as believers need to be together. We need to be reminded. I've learned in pastoral ministry and the preaching ministry that it's not so much about revealing oftentimes as it is about reminding. It's not about sharing a new thing so much as it is reminding you of what you already know. So uh, this is a reminder of the direction that the Lord wants us to move. So for the next three weeks, this message and two more successive mes messages, uh, we're going to be sharing with you about this idea of togetherness. And we're going to talk about being together in fellowship. We're going to be talking about being together in purpose and being together in ministry. Now... There's a verse that speaks of the, earth, the church in its earliest stages. In the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we find these words. And it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. In the breaking of bread and in prayers. They didn't just have church. They also had fellowship. Now... What happens when we believe? When we believe and we come to faith in Christ, we are in fellowship with Christ. But that's not all that happens. We're not only brought into fellowship with Christ, but we're brought into fellowship with his body. And what happened as these people shared fellowship in Christ and in his body is that the effect of that was something that would change their world. And people of God, can I tell you today that what this world needs in this moment, I know I sound like a broken record, but I'm sincere in what I'm saying, that what this world needs in this moment is a church that has got a hold of God that has got on their face before God and they're sharing something among them that makes a difference in the world around them. Now fellowship has continued to be expounded in this passage, but today I want to use it as a springboard to speak to you about the fellowship that we are to experience as believers. In the Bible we learn that we... The church, we're often referenced by a Greek term. You can call it ecclesia or ecclesia, however, whatever book you looked up the pronunciation in, because there's a couple of different uh, ones of those. But in the simplest interpretation, it means to be called out. Called out. 
But for what reason are we called out? We read Peter, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 says this, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now I want to stress to you this morning that it's not only important just from what we've been called, but it's also important to what we've been called. Not just from what we've been called, but to what we've been called. We've been called out of darkness. We've been called into his marvelous light. But Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, also says this, 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You and I have been called out of darkness and called into fellowship with our Lord and with one another that what happens among us would be the physical representation of the character and the nature of God in this community. Our fellowship is to be a witness to those that are around us. You remember what Jesus said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples. Not because you show up to church every Sunday morning, not because you know all the hymns without holding the book, not not because you recite Bible verses, but by this will all men know that you're my disciples because you have love one for another. There's to be a dynamic in the family of God that bears witness to the world around us of the reality of the Christ we claim. I forget who it was, but it was some Eastern religion uh, leader that came in. I think it was the Dalai Lama, maybe might have been, that came to America. And he said, you know, I love your Jesus, but I don't believe he's resurrected. I love his principles but I don't believe he's risen. And they ask him, why? And he says, well, if he is supposed to be risen and that is supposed to be his body, he had visited a church. He said, then that body declares that he's still dead. There's no proof that he's alive. It's not just you and Jesus. It's it's not just fellowship with him that Jesus desires for you and I to have. We sing the song, he's all I need, and certainly he is. And understand me this morning, there's nothing redemptive necessarily in the relationships on the horizontal plane. There's nothing, I can't get close enough to you to save me. I have to get close to Jesus. But that's not all that Jesus intended for us as we're walking here on this earth. He wants us to have each other and he wants us to have fellowship together in him. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself placed such a high value on the idea of fellowship and togetherness of the church that he said in Matthew chapter 5, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way and first. As a matter of fact, Jesus places a priority on this and says, First, go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. I had a lady tell me one time that she was suddenly stricken after nearly a decade of serving the Lord. She was suddenly, you know, stricken with an awareness that there were other people that that served the Lord as well and that were a part of the body. And I just said, do explain that to me. Because I don't know how you sit in a body of believers in worship services and celebrations and things and you're not aware that there are other people around you serving the Lord. She said, well, it's just been me and Jesus wrapped up in our own little cocoon. Can I tell you that's not scriptural? That's not the way it works. 
We're not only called out to be in his presence, but we're called out to be among his people and to be sharing fellowship one with another and to be rejoicing one with another over the thing that we found in him. Amen? I want to tell you something. Pastor, I appreciate your words this morning. I appreciate you talking about the heart of worship, but can I tell you where the heart of worship should begin? It shouldn't begin here on a Sunday morning. This shouldn't be the primer that gets the well pumping for the rest of the week. But the primer needs to take place on Monday morning when your feet hit the ground and you realize that you've got another day fresh and full of His mercies that you're going to walk and experience His grace. And that's where it starts. And when we come together Sunday morning, it's just an overflow and a celebration of what we've been walking in all week long. Because we share that thing in common. We just, we greet one another. We love one another because we, we know the effective working of the grace of God in the lives of one another. Now I want to t- invite you this morning to turn with me to the epistle of 1 John. 1 John. If you're looking in the New Testament, go all the way to the back. Find the book of Revelation. It's a little sliver in your Bible. Find the book of Revelation, the book of Jude, back up through 3rd, 2nd, and then you'll be at 1 John. 1 John, and we're going we're gonna to take a, 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 a trek through, almost through the entire book of 1 John here this morning as we talk about this idea of fellowship. Now this is what I want you to understand, that 1 John, this is an epistle, it's written to the church. So many times we, we believers, we, we look into the word of the Lord sometimes and we like want to shovel it over our shoulder and you know we're sitting in the house and we're hearing the word of the Lord and we're thinking to ourselves the whole time, man, I sure hope whoever needs to hear this is here to hear it. Come on, somebody. Any of you ever done that? You like, praise God, I sure hope brother, sister, so-and-so is here to hear that. They need that word. Can I tell you this is a word written to the church? We all need it. We all need it. John wrote one of the four Gospels, but he also wrote these three epistles. The Gospels, of course, for those of you that are maybe new to Christianity or new to Bible study, is a, more or less a general accounting or a bit of a first-hand testimony that was written as a witness of the life and the earthly work of Jesus Christ. And we have four. They're Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You find those at the front of the New Testament. Then we have the historical narrative of the early church, which we find in the book of Acts, or as it's, as it's known by its short name, it's more properly known as the Acts of the Apostles. And we have the book of Revelation at the very end of the Bible, and, and that's basically a, the standalone prophetic piece of the New Testament. But between Acts and Revelation, we find a, a handful of books that have been written and that we refer to as epistles. Now, Basically, if you want to know what an epistle is, it's a letter. It's a letter written mostly by the apostles and addressed either to a certain church or an individual. And it's something that the Lord had emblazoned upon the hearts of those writers and said, write these things to my church, write this thing to these people. It may be the church at Galatia, the church at Thessalonica. It may be Paul writing to Timothy, his protege. But whatever the case, it's these letters that have been written. And this is one of John's three letters to the church, not counting, of course, as we said, his gospel in the book of Revelation. And I want you to remember, if I didn't stress this, that it's written to the church. Now, as I begin to share and we unfold and walk through these things together this morning, I want you to understand that I don't today, nor do I any other day, stand before this pulpit as a foremost expert and somebody that's got it all figured out and got it all nailed down. But most of what you hear on Sunday morning is me counseling myself in the word of the Lord, and you have the privilege of listening along. And I'm challenged by this text, and I pray that you will be as well. 
Because this, this little book here, it's just a couple of pages if you're looking. And, you know, if you have a good Bible like mine, it takes no more than two and two-thirds of a page. It's a little, a, little, a little piece of writing that's here. And in, contained, though, in this book, it is power-packed because we learn in it about the grace of God. In John, 1 John 1 and 9, John writes to the church and says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It talks about in John chapter 2 and again in 1 John 5 about the evil influences of this world and how we need to steer clear of those and the effect that those things can have in our lives. In John chapter 2, verse 28, beginning all the way through the first three verses of, uh, of chapter 3, Paul, uh, John writes about the blessed hope of the church, and he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. But, beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3 and 4, verses 4 through 9 talk about the effect of sin. And then in 1 John 5, we read about that confidence that we should have in prayer when we go to the Lord. John writes to the church and says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of Him. What a powerful book. It's a powerful letter to the church to remind us of the glorious riches that are ours in Christ Jesus. But today, if you have factored in your mind and you have reasoned that I'm being repetitious today in a series of messages that I'm talking about togetherness in the body of Christ, then I want you to consider this with me this morning. That of the 105 verses approximately here in the, in the New King James Version of this letter, approximately 30% of this letter deals with the resounding and intermingled theme that shows that there is a close and we might say a strict association between the fellowship that we have with Christ Jesus our Lord and the fellowship that we share together in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's some, there's some pretty strong counsel that's given in this letter. And I, I love teaching John's epistles here. If, if you could see, this is my favorite Bible on the planet. First of all, it lays open when I tell it to. There's nothing more aggravating a book you try to lay down and it folds back up, right, in the pages. But if you could see this, I wish I could show it to you all. Nearly the whole text of 1 John is underlined in red with notes scribbled all over the margins. And I just love the richness of this word. But no less in this short two and two-thirds page of Scripture, no less than six times, and some may argue more than that, it's not a real exact science. It was just a quick summary of the, of the book, of the letter here. No less than six times in the course of this letter, John takes up the issue of Christian fellowship in one sense or another. So I want you to look with me. If you've got notes on the back of your bulletin this morning, there's some blanks there for you. And those are intentionally there for all the OCD people in the house that you would not be satisfied until you've got all the blanks filled in and you will pay close attention to hear those answers. But number one in, in the book of 1 John, we learn that fellowship with other believers is an anticipated activity for partakers of the gospel. John writing there, 1 John 1, ch uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says this, That which was from the beginning 
which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. John says what he's doing here, he's laying out his credentials as an apostle, a first-hand witness. I love this part because John's not saying, hey, let me tell you something that somebody told me. Let me tell you what I heard down at the town square, at the town common. No, he's not saying any of that. He's saying, let me tell you some things that I know firsthand. I witnessed it. I saw it going down. He wrote, this is reminiscent of his gospel where he writes and says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then he skips down a few verses and says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is reminiscent of that same thing. And John says, I'm here to preach you a gospel that I know firsthand. And this is what he says. He says that you may also have fellowship with us. Right? Did I read that right? Does your Bible say the same thing? If it doesn't, yours is wrong. I'm sorry. That you may also have fellowship with us. John says here, it's not, hey, we're not just selling fire insurance. I'm just, I'm not just here to preach to you so that you can say that you're saved and remain an island to yourself, but I'm sharing a first-hand gospel account with you that you can come into fellowship with us and we together can share the riches of our inheritance in Christ Jesus. We've come, we've come to you preaching not simply not simply so that we're all saved, but to share fellowship in Him. You know, sometimes we emphasize and we often emphasize the personal relationship with Christ. And certainly that needs to be emphasized. You need a personal walk with the Lord. But we also need to give attention to our corporate relationship in Christ as well. The second thing is this. That fellowship with other believers is the natural outflow of walking in the truth. 1 John 5, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7 says this, This is the message which we heard from him to, and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I, I think we could certainly do a whole message on these verses alone. There are, there are many so-called Christians who have a broken fellowship with the body of Christ. And their, the brokenness of their fellowship is often blamed on the rest of the body of Christ. Well, it's always somebody else's shortfall. It's always somebody else's shortcomings and misgivings. That's, that's the reason that I can't share. They blame it on organized religion. They blame it on uh, a, a disdain for the leadership. But the fact of the matter here is laid out before us by John is that their fellowship is broken with the body because they're not walking in the truth. They're not living in the light of his word. They're not being honest with themselves and, and before God about the, own, their, the issues of their own lives. Not only is the fellowship with the saints uh, the natural outflow of walking in the truth, but it's, it's also the proof that we are walking in the truth. Number three, John shows us that our relationship with other believers is an indicator of our spiritual condition. Now, I want, you to, I want you to listen to this. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because darkness has blinded his eyes. That is 
1 John 2, 9 through 11. Then we skip down here to verse, chapter 3, verse 10. It says, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. In other words, this is where the wheat and the tares are separated. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Again, chapter 3, verse 14 says this, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. John is, John is so pointed with this writing that it's often hard to find the words to add any exposition to what's being said. Could it, could it be any more plain? If you hate your brother, you're in darkness, the very thing out of which you have been called. Verse 14, John says that it's our fellowship that is given as a true spiritual indicator. Number four, our love for fellow believers is the proof that we love God. And you're such a lively crowd this morning that I don't know whether to read this text or to sing it in song form and have you stand and participate with me. But I know down in the kids' church they may be singing this song. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. How many of you sang that when you were kids? Yeah. You want to do it right now, don't you? <laughs> Kathy, you were a little too excited about that. John says if we do not love and placed in the greater context of this passage we would say especially have love for the brethren then we don't even know who God is. He who loves not knows not who God is. That is profound. That is powerful. We've not understood the, the character of the one that we say that we seek to serve and the one that we say that we're striving to be like. And finally, the love that we have for believers is indicative of the love that we have for God. I want you to look at this real closely with me here. John here considers the irony that, that someone would say that they love God whom they've not seen but hate their brother that's standing right in front of them. Would you, would you just look at that with me this morning? 1 John chapter 4, the concluding verses there, verses 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God but hates his neighbor, Is what? A liar. I remember one time I was on the playground. I went to a Christian school. And we had to recite these long passages of scripture every month. And we did some, uh, and you had to do it in King James or it didn't count. we were out on the playground and we had been studying some of the scripture in 1 John and there were a couple of fellas out on the playground they got mad with one another and the one little kid started kind of casting shade on the other one saying some things about him his little face turned red his neck vein kind of started throbbing there real hard and he looked at his friend he said you're a liar and the truth ain't in you I mean, that's what it says in the Word, right? So you're just quoting, quoting Scripture there. But <laughs> He says, if someone says, I love God and 
and hates his brother. He is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. He who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot in other words, if we love the one we say we're begotten of, then we also love him who is begotten of him. So if I say that I am born of God, I am begotten of God, and I love him because of that, then I've got to look at my brother here and say, because I love God, I'm commanded by... I didn't ask you if you liked him or not. Okay? That is incidental. Has nothing to do with it. There's a lot of things in Scripture I don't like. But I'm commanded. And this it says, if I'm going to love Jesus who, who brought me out of darkness into light and has given me new life and I'm born again in Him, then I'm commanded to love my brother, my sister. This brother, this brother, I love this brother. When I grow up, I was telling y'all, it's my target right here. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him, who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. You know, John is here, as I said, considering the irony that we would say we love God that we haven't even seen and we wouldn't love the child of God that we lay our eyes on on a regular basis. And I just want to say this to you, and I'm not trying to be insensitive here this morning. I'm just simply speaking truth. There's, there's something dysfunctional about a family when the kids don't like each other. Right? I mean, is that right or wrong? And I, I know that you can't control the way other people feel and the way other people act. Maybe you got some real pistols in your family. I, I'm not, I'm, hey. shake my family tree hard enough a few nuts will fall out of it I... and I understand that not all dysfunction is, is by our own choosing sometimes it's just cast upon us but as much as it depends on the child of God there shouldn't be any as much as it depends on me John says that the person who is born of God who knows that they have been born of God should also love others who are born of God and we should love our spiritual siblings we should all love one another thank you brother Appreciate you. we've not just been called into an isolated existence with our Savior we've been called body of Christ and we being many members are one body one body now my hand looks different than my foot it functions different than my foot but it's all a part of my body. I value all of it the same way. I don't want any of it hurt. 
I don't want any of it dismembered. Right? Come on, somebody. I want it all intact. I want it all to get along. Bad things happen when the body starts doing things involuntarily and out of sync with other parts. We need to be together. Not only with Christ, but together in Christ. Amen? I want to invite you to stand all over this sanctuary this morning. tell you something. This is what I want you to do as we close today. We sang earlier about reckless love. And sometimes love requires recklessness. Because we've got so many things calculated into the equation that it almost seems hazardous. Or maybe even to give ourselves to somebody else, to make ourselves vulnerable to them. But I want you this morning to share the reckless love of God with some other folks here in this room. Just want to close with a celebration. A celebration of being one in the body of Christ. Lee here is just as much a part of me in the body of Christ as my hand is to my physical foot. And the same for Brian and Ellison. this work. Brother, I love you with the love of the Lord and I appreciate your family. You're an encouragement to me and I love serving in the body of Christ with you. Amen. Can you just share some reckless love here as we conclude? You'll be able to consider yourselves dismissed as you're moving through. It's a good time for the introverts to scatter. Father, we love you. We thank you for the love that is ours in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for the fellowship of the saints. Now, Father, as we go today, God, Lord, let us love one another in the way that you've commanded. Father, that we would be bound together with a cord of love that would not easily be broken. And we give you the glory and the praise and the honor. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you share the love of Christ.